Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania's ending and post credit scenes explained. Welcome back to Nerdist News. I'm Hector Navarro, and today we're diving headfirst into the quantum realm with the release of Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. This third Ant film ushers in phase five of the Marvel Cinematic Universe by immediately introducing us to the big bad, Kang the Conqueror on the big screen. Yeah, okay, a version of Kang was previously introduced in the Disney Plus series Loki, but that screen size was variable based on whatever TV or device you watch that show on. This video is intended to be watched after you've seen Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. We will be discussing the ending to the film as well as the two credit scenes in depth. So we want to give you a giant man-sized spoiler warning so you have enough time to go watch the movie and then enjoy some orange slices. Uh, <laughs> Does anyone have any orange slices? Also, if you want to read more about the ending to Quantumania along with the credit scenes, Kyle Anderson's article over on Nerdist.com has you covered. But for real, stomp on out of here if you don't want to be spoiled. First off, we have the answer to the question that we know was on all of our viewers' minds. How many Kang stomps were there in Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania? There were three. That last one didn't connect, but he sure did stomp. Okay, okay, we know why you're really here. It's because in the film's finale, our heroes seemed to do the impossible. They prevented Kang the Conqueror from achieving his goal of escaping the quantum realm to wreak havoc on the main Marvel Universe. Scott Lang and Hope Van Dyne defeated Kang by shoving him into his multiversal engine core that was in the middle of exploding and imploding at the same time. Look, we're not Pym Particle scientists here, okay? We don't get how it works, but we're pretty sure Kang was killed. Or was he? Maybe. Or maybe not. I don't know. They all blew together after a while. So with Kang possibly dead, the rest of the heroes can hang up their suits for the remainder of Phase 5, right? Wrong. Because in a mirror to the film's opening, where Scott narrates his life while on a jaunty walk through San Francisco, he has a bit of an existential crisis. He recalls Kang's warnings about his other variants, which echoes the words of warning from He Who Remains at the end of Loki Season 1. Just wait till you meet my variants. In fact, this Kang and He Who Remains had very similar goals. Trim the timelines to keep the number of Kangs at a minimum. But... Back to that ending, Scott wonders if defeating Kang was a mistake, because maybe this exiled Kang would be the only Kang who was willing to help defeat all the other Kang variants coming down the line. Maybe he wasn't so bad. Maybe the Ant family did accidentally take out a potential ally. Nah, Scott was right. Kang was bad. Remember Janet Van Dyne's Kang vision? When Janet touched Kang's time travel ship, we assumed we were looking into Kang's violent past. But what she saw had a lot of visual similarities to Kang fighting the rebels in the film's finale. Perhaps Janet wasn't seeing Kang's murderous past, but his murderous future due to the nature of Kang and time travel. But even if she was just seeing the potential of Kang's evil, Kang still needed to be taken out. He gloated about how many rebellions he's put down in the past. So Scott and Hope and their family were right. Kang equal bad. Maybe most bad of all Kangs. This is wild. But this ending plays directly into what we see in the mid-credits sequence, the Council of Kangs. My variants. There we see three main Kang variants, Immortus, Ramatut, and a third futuristic Kang, acknowledge that the exiled Kang was defeated and the Avengers are starting to touch the multiverse. Immortus has summoned all of the Kangs together in order to put their plan in motion since they are late. It's just a little ironic humor coming from Immortus. It's obvious that Jonathan Majors is going to have a lot of fun playing all of these wildly different versions of Kang. In the comics, Immortus, the Kang with that intense headwear, is an extremely powerful version of Kang, sometimes known as the Master of Time, which is why he seems to be taking the lead here. This older version of Kang has also been known to clash against Kang variants. Immortus first appears in 1964's Avengers No. 10, but this was before it was revealed that he was also Kang. Rama Tut, our second Kang is a Kang with a flair for the historical. In the comics, he went to Earth's past to conquer ancient Egypt with his futuristic technology while adopting the name Ramatut. He first appeared in 1963's Fantastic Four number 19, again before he was revealed to be Kang. We're still wondering if he might show up in Moon Knight's second season, if we're gonna get a Moon Knight season two. I'm sorry, what? There are a couple of options for that third cyborg-looking variant. Since he looks younger, it could be a variant like Kid Immortus. Or maybe it's the Scarlet Centurion, but without being called Scarlet, in order to avoid confusion with the Scarlet Witch. 
Each of these variants of Kang have their own stories in the comics, but basically, Kid Immortus is a younger Kang after he embraces his evil future, and Scarlet Centurion is a Kang after his time spent in Egypt as Rama Tut. He comes to the present, meets Doctor Doom, and is inspired to take on a new identity, the Scarlet Centurion, which Kang also later considers to be a failure, so he just goes back to being Kang the Conqueror. And back to the Council, as Kangs from across the timeline and multiverse begin to pop in, we can see them using the classic Time Platform, a time machine also used by Reed Richards in Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, and one that originally came from inventor Doctor Doom in the comics. It's important to note that in the comics, Kang, hailing from the future, claims he's a descendant of both Richards and Doom, so that would explain where he gets that time platform. We also see reference to that classic comics image from Avengers number 292 of the Council of Kangs in their assembled arena, complete with that weird lizard Kang. There were many variants popping in and generally having a rowdy time, but we also spotted one costume that looked like a nod to Kang Prime's robes. We were definitely hoping to see Pope Immortus from the timeline where Immortus started the Church of Immortus, but we didn't get a close enough look. Praise be to Kang. Praise be to him. Oh, but what is their ultimate plan, this Council of Kangs? We shall see more of it in the future. And maybe the past, because, you know, time travel. The Kang of the Quantum Realm was obsessed with knowing he was in a loop. He's seen how things ended, and he was trying to avoid that. Whether that meant only his own end, or the end of the variance plans, remains to be seen. And now it's time we discuss the post-credits sequence. How does it all end? This was a straight-up tease for Season 2 of Loki, with Loki and Agent Mobius seemingly in the early 1900s, watching a man named Victor Timely unveil an invention. What am I looking at? But who is Victor Timely? <laughs> well, our TVA Loki is scared to see the face of He Who Remains, since Victor Timely looks like Jonathan Majors, we know he's a Kang variant as well. In the comics, Victor Timely is a version of Kang who traveled into Earth's past to establish the town of Timely, Wisconsin, and become its mayor. Certainly less ambitious than we normally think of Kang. He eventually founds a version of Chronopolis, his time travel stronghold, around Timely, Wisconsin on Earth. Investigating this time anomaly on Earth might be why Loki and Mobius have shown up. Or they might be on the run, turning to someone they think can help, only to discover yet again another Kang. What? It feels like this scene is also a clip from the second season of the Loki series, instead of something shot specifically for the end of Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Victor Timely even ties into the creation of the Human Torch. But hold your horses, not the Human Torch of the Fantastic Four, although we are going to see him in the upcoming Fantastic Four flick. We're talking about the original character known as the Human Torch, who is an android that first appeared all the way back in Marvel Comics number 1 in 1939. This was before the Marvel Comics line was published by Marvel Comics The Company, back when the publisher was known as Timely Comics. Wait, Timely Comics? Oh no, are we living in a Kang-controlled reality? <laughs> are you Kanging me right now? What? Anywho, as we learned in 1992's Avengers Annual number 21, the Human Torch's creator, Dr. Phineas T. Horton, studied under Victor Timely. So this means there's a chance we could see the OG Marvel character show up in Loki Season 2. We did see a reference to this Human Torch and its creator at the World Exposition of Tomorrow featured in Captain America the First Avenger, remember? There's the B-roll right there. Will Victor Timely be the Kang variant we see ruling the TVA at the end of Loki's first season? It's always possible with Kang. Each version of Kang we meet could be either a multiversal variant of Kang or a single Kang at different points in his life. Time travel! <laughs> you said it, Hulk. We're going to be learning more about Victor Timely once season two of Loki premieres on Disney Plus in the summer of 2023. And more importantly, when will we see the deadliest Kang variant? Kangaroo the Conqueror. In Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, did Spider-Ham already defeat him? I guess we'll find out when Across the Spider-Verse comes out in theaters on June 2nd, 2023. But in the meantime, what do you folks think? Where will we see the Council of Kangs next? Do you think we're going to see any more Kang variants in Loki Season 2? It'll be fun, though. Yeah, it'll be really fun. Let us know in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. And for the latest and greatest in the world of pop culture, stay tuned to Nerdist.com.